Good evening. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Tony uh, for inviting me uh, to this wonderful uh, event. And uh, I, I think in preparation, you know, I was trying to think about the reasons why um, he invited me to speak on this panel. And I came up with two reasons specifically. One, um, my focus is on communities. I study communities. Um, but two, my second uh, focus and passion really has to do with ex-offender reentry. Um, I'm a political uh, a social scientist, I'm a public policy analyst, and what I find um, oftentimes is when I'm reading public policy documents is a huge gap in terms of what's going on in the community, the way it's being articulated by uh, certain academics, and, uh, and I had a problem with that. So I approached Tony a few years ago, um, and we had a number of conversations. I actually sat in the back of that room um, and had a, an aha moment when uh, I was struggling with uh, my dissertation uh, committee regarding you know, what I wanted to study. And they're like, why do you want to do that? Go do something else. And I said, no, that's what I want to do. Um, and they didn't like that. So um, I went back and forth, and for the following three years, up until just uh, very recently, um, I guess I could say I kind of won that fight because after all of that, they're like, okay, we're convinced. But it took about three years of um, research and defining and going back, um, back and forth and basically saying, this is why Du Bois is valuable. This is why I think he's relevant today. This is why I'm going to use him and we can fight, but you know, I wasn't backing down. So anyway, um, I found that Du Bois's work is particularly relevant. I'm sorry, I don't have um, a PowerPoint, and I do better if I speak uh, extemporaneously. Um, I found that Du Bois's work is particularly relevant to public policy for the following reasons. First, Du Bois defined what it means to conduct urban research that is both historically grounded and sociological in nature. Uh, in other words, history matters, and so does the environment you live in. Okay? So, uh, Du Bois pointed out, one cannot study the Negro in freedom and come to general conclusions about his destiny without knowing his history in slavery. And that's a quote that I took from uh, the study of Negro problems, uh, one of his essays. In terms of the environment, Lewis Gordon puts it this way, social analysis requires a different way of reading problems. Okay, and Du Bois allows us uh, to do this. Second, Du Bois provided a blueprint for public policy analysis that moves us beyond what are called single issue studies. So these are studies that look at one issue and one issue only. So if you're looking at, let's say, uh, for example, um, voter registration among African Americans, that's the only thing you focus on which kind of takes you in a very narrow you know, focus and may leave out, depending on the questions that are being asked, a number of other factors that are important to the study and analysis um, of the problem. Uh, another issue that I found was that you know, in terms of cost-benefit analysis and uh, quantitative tools, that these things are also very limiting in terms of trying to understand what is going on at the level of communities. So what Du Bois gives us is a set of tools um, whereby we can question, analyze, and present qualitatively what could be measured through careful scientific empirical study. Third, Du Bois introduced a political dimension. Gordon characterizes it as a political nihilism. That is, the view that one's political institutions are incapable of responding to one's social needs. So when I was thinking about um, reentry, or I came upon reentry rather, um, circuitously. I started off, you know, looking at uh, voter registration. This was something that I, you know, a lot of the literature was permeated with, you know, issues of uh, voter registration in the black community. So I started there. Then I moved on to, you know, oh, mass incarceration. So this is the problem that we have. As a result, you know, all these people cannot uh, vote or they're very limited in terms of regaining their rights to vote, et cetera, et cetera. But that led me to other questions, um, and I know that Michelle Alexander has popularized, um, you know, the the notion of mass incarceration through her book, uh, The New Jim Crow. Um, I take uh, some issues uh, with uh, Miss Alexander's work, and I'll talk about that momentarily. But I think that you know she focuses too narrowly on uh, one issue. Mass incarceration is important, um, and I'm going to speak about that. But again. Um, what I find is that you can't just examine one 
single thing, that you have to understand the issue in context. And that context usually takes you far outside um, and far afield from the very thing that you started uh, analyzing. So if I look at, you know, uh, again, Ms. Alexander's work, she does a really good job in raising questions regarding the structural problems of the carceral apparatus. However, she fails to articulate how it is that those who are victimized by the system should come to interrogate it and work to dismantle it. I'm just saying, if, you know, you're going to throw it out there, um, what do you do about it? How is it that people come to, you know, figure out, okay, well, I, I know that the structure is there. She speaks of, you know, the um, individuals, you know, as a sort of monolithic group uh, who somehow are going to, you know, I don't know, um, come to some sort of epiphany, as if they don't already know that the structure is screwing them. Pardon my French. Um, but anyway. Um, Instead, what she does is she draws upon examples which she never fully develops, and she relies on what I think are outdated tropes to make her point appeal to a mainstream audience, an appeal it has. I'm sure that uh, it's way up there on the Amazon uh, bestseller uh, list. Not hating that, okay? Okay, maybe just a little bit, okay, but you know, such is life. I think we're okay to um, critique and criticize when people are wrong. Um, or are missing the point. For example, what she does is she refers to communities um, with a predominantly African American population as the ghetto, as if every single community that is predominantly African American is a ghetto, which I find highly problematic. Uh, and to those who live in these communities as ghetto dwellers, I almost I threw that book. I wanted my $22 back, but they wouldn't give it back to me when I, you know. Anyway, in addition, she argues that if not um, for mass incarcerations, uh, mass incarceration, these individuals would be in college. As far as I'm concerned, this sets up a false dichotomy. Instead of addressing the structural problem that undergirds how it comes to be that in a city like Philadelphia, for example, the high school graduation rate is about 50%, she assumes that, or she argues that, college is the alternative to prison, but fails to address the problems that, uh, with the education system that prevent most individuals from reaching a college uh, setting. I think that that is, you know, th those are some of the most glaring uh, things that she really missed in terms of um, her analysis. Now, this may help one sell books, but it is uncritical. And in Du Bois's words, uh, and I quote him here, much of the work done on the Negro question is notoriously uncritical uncritical from lack of discrimination in selecting and weighing of evidence, uncritical in choosing the proper point of view from which to study problems, and finally, uncritical from the distinct bias in the minds of so many writers. Go back to the ghetto dwellers comment that I referred to a few minutes ago. That said, um, there are numbers, a number of things that I think she did well, and I'm going to name two. Um, one, I think she makes it clear that mass incarceration affects everyone in the black community, regardless of socioeconomic status. And when I say community, I'm speaking very broadly, okay? Um, she admits that her own son, a uh, teenage son at the time, a high school honor roll student, uh, was arrested and sentenced to four months in a boot camp diversionary program, okay? Uh, and second, uh, another thing that I think she does really well is that she clearly articulates how mass incarceration in the United States operates as a race-neutral system, put that in giant quotes, but that it is um, actually uh, very racist, okay? I argue that while mass incarceration is still very important in shaping the life chances of millions of individuals, that we have managed through a myriad of public policy initiatives to expand a carceral apparatus so that ev uh, even when one is no longer incarcerated, they remain part of the prison regime. I disagree with Ms. Alexander that mass incarceration is worse than Jim Crow. Um, mass incarceration evolved out of a system of racialized slavery, which was later supplanted by Jim Crow, as you so aptly pointed out in uh, Waquant's um, table there. I outline a number of reasons why I believe that reentry has supplanted mass incarceration as the most important mechanism of race making that we have ever seen, and how the failure to effectively dismantle mass incarceration has contributed to what is now a nefarious and wide-reaching system of control. 
No doubt that mass incarceration will continue to be the most visible expression of the color line for some time to come, but we need to consider what is currently happening in communities as a result of what I call mass decarceration, or what is also known in policy circles as ex-offender reentry. So it's basically the release of people back into the community. Uh, and first, the communities to which formerly incarcerated individuals often return are politically, socially, and economically marginalized. They're concentrated in urban centers, as you pointed out in your map, by high rates of poverty and crime. There's also a concern that clustering, that is the high concentration of ex-offenders in some communities, will impact both the short and long-term prospects of these communities. So this takes us beyond the level of the individual. While I'm concerned with what happens with specific individuals when they return to communities, when you look at the aggregate, when you look at what happens when you have a thousand people being released from prison every single year returning to one zip code, you have a major problem and that needs to be analyzed within the context um, of that framework. Um, a couple of authors, uh, Lynch and Sabal argue that policy alternatives should be guided by information on the nature of reentry of the reentry problem and specifically how absorbing the larger number of released prisoners is different from accommodating the return of smaller groups in the past. These authors also point out that increases in the number of released prisoners are not in and of themselves grounds for new policy initiatives. As returning prisoners are not an undifferentiated mass, back to Michelle Alexander, um, Changes in a composition of re-entering prisoners may be more important than the size of the re-entry pool alone. Moreover, these same authors posit that if the inmates returning now are different from those returning previously in ways that facilitate or complicate re-entry, or if they are entering a society or a particular community that is more or less able to absorb them than communities in the past, then this could constitute a new opportunities and problems that could require new responses. Second point, churners, those returning to prison after release. So we understand that there are a lot of people that once they get um, released, return to prison. It's something like 67% of individuals who are released from prison will be rearrested within a three-year time frame mm -hmm. and go back to prison. So there's a huge issue. Again, something else that um, I, I think Alexander misses. I'll stop that. I know, so it's like make her happy. <laughs> or maybe not. I think I'll make Tony happy. Turners are growing at a faster rate than they are successfully completing parole. At the end of 2009, more than 5 million individuals were on probation of, or parole. Out of these, 4 in 10 returned to prison within three years of release, while 24% returned to prison as a result of violating the terms of their supervision. Only 9% returned as a result of a new conviction. So when we look at crime statistics and we look at the numbers and we say, oh my God, black people are killing each other and all this stuff is going on, we need to understand, one, how those statistics are compiled. The UCR and the NCS are voluntary reporting systems. So if a police uh, you know, department or district decides that they want to contribute their numbers, and that's the only district that's contributing numbers, you're gonna see a huge spike. So I think, you know, and they tell you this if you go to the website, all right? If you go to the FBI website, there's a nice little disclaimer there that tells you how you need to read these statistics so that you're not necessarily led astray. Um, another thing that I uh, noticed in the course of my own study was that when you look at places like Frankfurt, for example, which is more than 50% white, and you compare that to some place like Cobbs Creek, where I focus most, much of my study, uh, which is 88% African American currently. The people that are returning to prison, okay, are concentrated in Cobbs Creek. They're returning to prison as a result of VOP, what's called violation of probation. The people in Frankfurt are, return, are going to prison for what are called series one offenses violent crimes, rape, armed robbery, murder. But when you read the reports, and I'm thinking of one report specifically that was compiled by um, a couple of University of Pennsylvania professors for the mayor's office on ex-offender reentry in 2007, they identify Cobbs Creek as one of the communities that has the highest returning number of ex-offenders. And I said, oh, okay, well, let's see what's really going on there. And what I discovered was that once you start 
peeling back the layers, some very interesting things start to happen. But those things are never mentioned in any report. So it's misleading, right? And we're not saying that everything is perfect in the black community, but we're saying that we need to look a little bit deeper and ask a different set of questions. Fourth, there has been a considerable increase in the number of prisoners being released. About 95% of the prisoners that are arrested will be released at some point. So it's uh, wrong to think that we're, you know, locking up only the worst of the worst. We're not. We're locking people up for petty offenses, including, as I mentioned previously, violation of probation. Fourth, the virtual elimination of discretionary release and a shift away from case management to supervision, parole, and surveillance has exacerbated the problem of reentry. According to the U.S. Department of Justice, the total number of adults under correctional supervision in the United States was 6,889,800 in 2003. That's almost 7 million people under the control of um, the correctional uh, system. Of this number, more than 4 million were on probation or parole. At the end of 2010, there were an estimated 4,887,000 adults under supervision in the community, either on probation or parole, the equivalent of about one out of every 48 adults in the United States. So how many people we got in this room? Do the math. <laughs> Number five, a shift from rehabilitative models of justice to retributive models has led to decreased funding programs that support the needs of individuals in prison and post-release. A 2001 report by the, by the GAO, the General Accounting Office, offers evidence in support of this point. 27% of both federal and state inmates participated in vocational training programs. 11% of federal inmates worked in prison industry jobs, compared with 2% of the state inmates, and 37% of federal inmates participated in pre-release program, co compared with only 12% of state inmates. Okay? I'll allow you to draw your own conclusions there. I'm, I'm sure we can talk about it further in the Q&A. Seventh point. The use of incarceration for individuals with mental illness has reached a critical mass. The Bureau of Justice Statistics reported that in 2006, 24% of jail inmates and 15% of state prisoners suffered from a serious mental illness. What this means in terms of reentry is that when, when one is released, we have a failure, there's not a, the service capacity is um, the term that we use, to provide the support for individuals with mental illness. In the same report that I uh, spoke about earlier, what they found with these authors authors found is that for communities like Cobbs Creek, for example, or even um, further if you go to southwest Philly, etc., most of the services are located in Center City. Um, figure that out, all right? That's brilliant. Number seven, the privatization of the prison industry has reshaped the carceral apparatus in profound ways. The increasing demands that state-managed institutions have had to deal with, along with policies designed to make it easier to send repeat offenders to prison, created a multi-billion dollar industry. In 2009, it was estimated at $38.8 billion. That's a nice chunk of change, right? <sighs> Eight. Women represent the fastest growing population of inmates and ex-offenders. Women are also the primary caregivers for small children, and 80% of women in prison are serving time for nonviolent offenses. There's a growing body of research that looks at women in reentry, but more work is sorely needed in this area. According to the Women in Prison Project, women's incarceration exacts a devastating social, emotional, and economic toll on families and communities. For example, about 75% of New York's female inmates reported being parents compared to 58% of men. The majority of incarcerated mothers were the primary caretakers of their children, many as single parents. Women are also more likely than men to have more than one child. An estimated 11,000 children have a mother incarcerated in, New in a New York prison or jail. Although over two-thirds come from and will likely return to New York City or its suburbs, more than 40% of New York's women prisoners are incarcerated in Albion Correctional F Facility, located more than 370 miles from their families and homes. 
that'll do a great job in terms of reentry, right? Uh, helps the community. Uh, we do value families in this country, don't we? Ooh, Ouch, right? There you go. Anyway, um, the final point, uh, and this is a wonderful uh, group of um, social scientists and, uh, and theorists. They um, are out of uh, the City University of New York. Um, they wrote an article called uh, Life Capacity Beyond Reentry, a Critical Examination of Racism and Prisoner Reentry Reforms in the U.S. And I, I quote them here. They said, the racial structures informing mass incarceration remain unnamed and untouched by virtually the entire gamut of reentry reforms, models, and proposals. Further, the racism that has been central to mass incarceration may be undergoing transformation to a crude evolutionary or biopolitical racism that makes measure of a population's life capacity or the seeming lack thereof come to represent its risk to vitality, the security, or the future of the society as a whole. Yeah, think about that for a second, right? Reason I chose Du Bois, right? Uh, so I looked at one, what could Du Bois help me understand about ex-offender re-entry in a community. And first thing I understood was Du Bois was someone who could speak authoritatively about race, right? So he crafted um, a robust theory of race. He articulates it by taking account of the role of race in community and institutions. And for me, for what I was trying to do, that was a really important thing, right? Second, Du Bois was concerned with the problems at the level of communities. His study on the Seventh Ward is a prime example, and you see 600 plus pages over there. I don't know how he did it. I mean, my dissertation is like 250 pages long, and uh, boy, without a computer, <laughs> props. Anyway, second, Du Bois was concerned with problems at the level of communities. Du Bois' study of the Seventh Ward marked a watershed moment in the development of social science, ethnographic, phenomenal, ugh, I can say that, phenomenological and urban geographic research by offering a methodological approach that is wonderfully elegant and clear. As Elijah Anderson put it, Du Bois showed the spatial mismatch that existed between African Americans and how the lack of available employment impacted the inner city as a whole, but had a profound impact on the communities where African Americans remained segregated within the city. Du Bois was able to illustrate how race and economic factors worked against the successful transformation of marginalized communities. More than 100 years later, the problems that Du Bois first documented persist. While the population of Philadelphia, as with other major cities, has grown exponentially since 1899, the problems have grown as well. As I cited previously, um, or said previously, my focus was on uh, Cod's Creek, and what I discovered was actually uh, pretty fascinating. I'd like to say, really, um, in conclusion, and we can, I'm sure, talk about this a little bit more, um, what I found in uh, missing in these studies was that, you know, there were a lot of suggestions um, a lot of prescriptions for what the community could do. Um, one report by the Department of Justice put the onus of responsibility on the individual ex-offender. How to motivate ex-offenders, you know? And I'm like, what the hell? Um, ex-offenders, to me, are pretty damn motivated. So I, I just baffled by the logic of the people who put this stuff together and say, well, this is where the problem is. Instead of looking, you know, and saying, well, wait a minute, something else is happening here. So I think some of these prescriptions um, don't necessarily uh, take us far enough. Uh, Tony and I were having a conversation before um, the presentation. I was running through all of my points, and I agree with him when he says that, you know, um, as Angela Davis um, has so aptly pointed out, that um, really what we need is an end to the prison industrial complex, and anything short of the abolition of the prison industrial complex is going to take us very far. Thank you. So we've had two very excellent presentations. Uh, are there any questions or comments from you? Yes. Can you stand up, please? Sure. Uh, my name is Colin. Uh, 
it's interesting to use the word abolition of the prison industrial complex. Uh, I'm not a researcher, but it seems that we have the new slave industry, the new slavery. You know, and uh, like the, for example, the, uh, the local cleaners delivers uh, loads of laundry to the prisons where it gets laundered. And uh, I don't know how many billions you just mentioned, but- uh, 38. That is the new slavery as far as I can tell. And with the children of these uh, incarcerated women, I would be curious to know how many of these children end up in child protective services. In other words, the future is the children belong to the state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Kim, would you like to respond to that? Yeah. Um, in terms of. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, could you repeat the question, Kim, or your understanding of the question, or the main points of the question? Well, I think uh, what you were outlining were the two issues in terms of uh, slavery, okay, and uh, the carceral apparatus acting as a new form of slavery. Um, and I would agree with you if anyone knows anything about Angola prison. Um, it is, uh, you know, sort of primary example of what is going on. I know um, in my classes when we start talking about slavery, they oh, it's over, we're post-racial, look, you got Oprah, you got Obama, what are you talking about? Um, and, you know, point out that, you know, we have a, we have a problem. When you have um, a place like Angola, which is known as the farm, um, and prisoners are basically out there picking cotton, and it's 2012, I mean, what the hell is going on? You know, so um, I think that these are the sorts of things that you know are obscured um, and not necessarily you know discussed, not discussed widely. Um, so unless you're in you know uh, public policy circles and other very limited areas, um, you're probably not going to have um, a very deep discussion about these issues. In terms of um, women, and this is pretty much where I anticipate my research will be taking me is that, yeah, you have an intergenerational problem. In many uh, communities throughout the country, it's pretty much a foregone conclusion that your kids are going to prison. Um, so if you're you know, in certain, born and raised in certain zip codes, um, if your mom went to prison, your dad went to prison, the likelihood is you're going to prison. Uh, and you know, we can look at all these other things, but that is very real. And I um, thank you for your comment and appreciate the question. Yes, Jim. Yes. <coughs> uh, just uh, an, um, an observation and, and um, something that I'd like to hear how other people respond to. Uh, it's sort of the residual sort of impact of violence. Um, when we talk about, for example, the murders that go on, we have the numbers. Uh, and another side to that that we don't present but has residual effect is the number of gunshot victims that go on per year and we don't the, the survivors are and that's roughly four times the size of, of the number of murders. The residual effect is um, <coughs> some of these folks manage well, others end up in all sorts of health, long-term health uh, things following that. And that sort of drops out of our, our, mm. our, our thing, thing. So it's just that observation I, I would bring up. And uh, it's, it's sizable, unfortunately. And I, I don't like talking about it. There. Jerry, would you like to uh, say something about this? We always look at, at homicide. We always look at homicide as um, you can, they can hear you, just talking to We always look at homicide as a personal phenomenon. And uh, when it gets to the proportions that we're talking about, and the gunshot wounds, the ones who get shot, just shooting a gun at somebody, uh, uh, it, on, in the Department of Behavioral Health, we talk a lot about trauma. And we talk about intergenerational trauma and the consequent compounded misery. So that what you have when you throw in the conditions of acute segregation, which lead to extreme social isolation, what you have is this compounded misery concentrated. And it has bred at the street level 
an unprecedented level of ruthlessness and callousness that uh, with the availability of automatic weaponry is, is a formula for, for disaster. And uh, much of it is generated by the so-called drug war. And uh, I'm here to tell you that the drug war is working. We are under the misassumption that the drug war is not working. I'm here to tell you that the drug war is working in a way that prohibition did not work. Prohibition did not work because too many, and you excuse my French, white people were getting killed. So it lasted 12 years. <laughs> blanc, blanc, sorry. Uh, uh, people are getting killed. So that stopped in, in, in 12 years, 19. The first thing Roosevelt did was get rid of that. This drug war goes on and on and on, and it gets us in a double bind because if on the one hand we don't shoot each other, then they have a justification to lock us up and control us so that the drug war is working consistent with the contempt and I'm suggesting to you that this level of homicide, brother, is socially generated. It's no longer personal. It's not randomly distributed through, through the city, through the society. So that when you see this systematic nature of homicides and the perpetrators of homicide, because it's mostly black on black among people who know each other, you're talking about the consequence of intergenerational trauma compounded misery and social isolation for people who historically, and I mean black men in particular, have been shown a special brand of contempt. So that we have to politicize this notion of homicide. And quite frankly, uh, it has something to do with the lack of generalized affection that is no longer a part of community life. So that um, while we're troubled, yes. while we're troubled, yes. and we take it personally, and we want the guy fried who shoots my sister, who shoots my brother, we have to, as social scientists, take a step back and look at the systematic nature of the thing and politicize the thing, so that folks under these conditions need relief. You have a governor that has just had draconian cuts in the educational system, earmarking these young people for these privatized prisons who guarantee 80% occupancy, revitalizing the hinterlands with the laundry services, with all the services, with the small lunch counters to feed the prison guards. Money gets allotted to the hinterlands because they count those inmates among the population of those and taken away from the communities from whence they come. So that when the brother talks about homicide, it ain't personal. It's sociological and it's political. And we have to look at it that way. It ain't about no stop and frisk. It's about revitalizing these communities with the monies that used to be there to support these single family households with supervision. No, no more daycare. No more after school programs. Uh, uh, no more uh, orchestras at the schools. So these kids and these young men, and I mentioned that the drug trade provides employment for these young men. It's a deadly line of employment. Yes, so that we have to look at these homicides and these shootings in political terms and in sociological terms, and, and yes, it, it, it is troubling, but I would suggest since we can't stop the shooting per se, we might be able to change how we look at it and ultimately get the politics of the thing on, on our I, side. Jerry, I'd like to um, uh, expand what you're saying because I'm familiar with your thesis. And Michelle Alexander, with all of the criticism you can make of her, she says this mass incarceration is due to political policy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. That people are elected and re-elected based upon being hard on crime, mm -hmm. meaning being hard on the Negro. Mm -hmm. Now, but Fo, I'd like to ask you this. Um, you said we have to see these murders as not uh, black on black, but a political system mm -hmm. and policies mm -hmm. that turn a community in upon itself mm -hmm. and then introduce drugs mm -hmm. as a economic factor, violent uh, as it is. My question to you, 
because you mentioned in your presentation that we have what you call these new jack politicians. Yes. That only need, only come to black people and only need black people once a year or once every four years. Or six if you want to be a senator. Okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> Since we don't have any black no, senators, no, 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 no. it's a moot yeah. <laughs> <a move> question. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'd like to know um, what would be your uh, proposal for an alternative politic and an alternative policy agenda to address this huge problem of misery, poverty, and mass incarceration? Well, if one can quote James Brown, there was a time when the policies prevailed that supported a community and to demonstrate in, in dollar terms, yes, that a, a respect for what you have been through. Uh, there, there were programs, I talk about, uh, uh, I have another phenomenon, hyper under supervision that uh, is a characteristic of Wacom's hyper ghetto. And what do I mean by that? Well, to begin with, single parent households, typically female, prevail. That's under supervision. But when that one parent has to go farther to work to get a job and work longer at that job to make the money to pay the bills that than, than she did five years hence, that under supervision becomes compounded. So that policy-wise, we have to look to Western Europe and Northern Europe for civilization. America's gift to the world is how to party. But when it comes to being civilized, we have to look to Western Europe. And we have to look to the policies that support women who are pregnant, irrespective of their marital status. We have to look at the policies that provide health care, irrespective of your employment status. That's how Joe Frazier used to talk about money as love. Yeah, I give money. I give love to my, to my, my baby's mother. You know, I give her a little love every time I see her. He meant money. And what we need is a, uh, is a, 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 a transfusion of the lifeblood, which is uh, money, back into the public schools, generously funded public schools, a single payer national health care that, uh, here, here. that is for, for everyone. And then you start to take the pressure, you start to take the pressure off of these communities so that every slight doesn't have to result in terminal violence. So this is what I mean by political. Occupy, yes. Not march, but occupy until we get this government back on our side. Now, all this talk about big government, you're not on your side. No, big government's on the side of the corporations. We need big government back on our side if there's going to be big government, because it is only through big government that you have the means of redistributing widely the uh, and, and make these corporations pay their taxes so that there is money, so that there is money. Your social security is not bankrupt. That's a lie. There's no fiscal crisis, but like Jesse Jackson said, in as much as there is one, let the people who had the party pay for the party. Yes. So that I would say that the policy agenda basically has to go back to the things that work. Uh, uh, Paul Simon has a song, Born at the Right Time. Du Bois was born during Reconstruction, that five seconds where they tried to do right. I was born in 1952 for the, for the next five seconds that they tried to do right. But all the money that I used to go to school, to come to Temple, that's all gone. I guess there's too many smart people coming out that wasn't buying in, that wasn't towing the line, so they cut it all out. First they give it to you and hope for a noble failure. Right. And then that can justify taking it away. But, but, but I digress. The, th the thing that we need, and what I mean by politicizing these things, is to press, to occupy, to insist that we redirect the apparatus of government, re-commandeer the apparatus of government so that it serves us, the people. Good. Ken, would, you, would you like to uh, reflect upon that question? I was going to add, um, to uh, some of the things that were said earlier as well as um, to this question, I think a lot of the violence that's going on is not just solely something that is endemic within the black community, but is really a reflection of what's going on at this level of states. Um, so that when we look at, you know, violence, um, the state is, you know, the most violent 
uh, of, of us all. Uh, so I think that that's something that's really important and seldom introduced in, into, the, into the discourse. Um, so I, I offer that as well. Um, and I completely agree with you regarding uh, the <coughs> analysis or looking toward uh, Western Europe. I know that a few years ago um, I was going to present at a conference in Finland uh, and I came across um, a colleague who focused uh, his research on what they call gentle justice. And I'm like, what? I mean, I couldn't believe it. You know, so their idea is that, you know, if people are going to be released from prison at some point, um, and most people are, uh, and that's not just something unique to what's going on here, but in Finland, that what they have is um, they house them in homes. Uh, you're not living in a, in a prison. You're not putting nonviolent offenders uh, with, or you know, people who are um, offenders of what we call victimless crimes, yes. in with the worst of the worst. So you know, in terms of providing the supports and reintegration programs, they're not that far. They're in the community. Um, but I know just even last year when Southwest Philadelphia, when it was proposed to put a reentry center in Southwest Philadelphia, the biggest opponents um, to that reentry center, and this would be, I mean, I think people's cousins, people's you know, families um, who would be housed there, the biggest opponents were the people in the community. And I was just like dumbstruck by, you know, this sort of, uh, you know, we need to get tough on. It's not just the politicians getting tough on, but it's also the people in the community who feel as though, well, I don't want it in my backyard. There's already this going on here, mm -hmm. not here. And I think that um, we need to re-examine that if we're going to have healthy uh, mm -hmm. communities as well. Now, let me just say one more thing. The state is not your friend. Mm -hmm. The state, <laughs> by definition, is coercive. Marx and Gramsci, they let us know that the state by definition is coercive. So the name of the game is leveraging concessions from that state. And when, when one asks Ralph Nader, when one asks Chomsky, well, what do we do? What do we do? He says, you know what to do. History is replete with what to do. Let's look back at what works. And what works is leveraging concessions from the state. This is how you got the Voting Rights Act. This is how you got the eight hour work day. This is how you got the minimum wages. Um, the wages, the, 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 um, uh, the cost of freedom, as Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young said, is buried in the ground. And that's how we got here. And that's what Occupy represents. That's the best thing to come along since the movement of the 40s. And it has not gone away. It may be in hibernation, but they're out there in cyberspace plotting and planning. And they deserve our support because they're carrying our water. Because the name of the game is to leverage concessions from the state. The president got in there and took our health care off the table, protected that pharmaceutical industry, protected that insurance industry, and now he's king of the drones. Uh, Yes, Tanae. Um, Fo uh, fo uh, Foeman. You can call him Fo. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. No, I, I meant I meant in terms of the policies of the states of Western Europe uh, regarding the well-being of the citizenry, uh, re uh, specifically regarding health care, daycare, uh, 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 the, the preservation of women's jobs when they get pregnant and they get to go back uh, with their jobs with any raises that occurred in their, in, their, um, in their absence. So those are the specific things that I was referring to. And when the we, I meant we, the people of the United States, who go without these things and don't dare even ask for those things because we have been socialized into the me and to the now. So we don't see, Europe lost 100 million people to war in the 20th century. So when they started looking at each, around at each other and saying, well, hey, we're the survivors, maybe we need a little bit more. And the, the, the state that came up in London and in the wake of World War II uh, included all the things that we need and now dare not ask for. So when I talk about Western Europe, that's the specific sense in which I, uh, in which I meant it. Yes. Uh, I wanted to uh, stand up. Hi, I really appreciate the uh, very stimulating presentations this afternoon. Right. And I wanted to ask you about something that I read about a while ago that uh, caught my attention because it seemed out of the norm of 
the traditional approaches governments use towards reentry uh, and uh, law enforcement. And I believe this gentleman wrote a book about it where uh, he, in Boston, went to the various uh, uh, drug dealers, and they knew who uh, they were. And instead of doing the traditional approach of trying to lock them up and so forth, they tried to strike an arrangement with them. And they gave them so much time to uh, stop doing what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And if they did that, uh, more positive things would happen for them. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you were familiar with that, and if you think that sort of approach might work here in Philadelphia. Seems like Mayor Nutter doesn't really lean toward that sort of approach, but no. like your comments. <laughs> um, no, I'm not familiar uh, with, with the book. Um, I would probably ask, one, what is the alternative? Um, you uh, alluded to this earlier when you were talking in terms of the informal um, and underground economy. Yes. Uh, so that, you know, when you have um, uh, thousands of young men concentrated in these communities, the educational opportunities are not there or they don't see that the opportunities are for them anymore. This notion of the American dream has gone, you know, down the drain. Um, many of the people in the community are unemployed. What is the alternative? I mean, if you're just going to give me time to not do drugs, I mean, hell, if I, you know, I'm, I'm a professor here. And, you know, it's like, we're not balling. You know, so it's like if, it, and given, you know, that I have all of the advantages of, you know, an excellent education, I, you know, uh, on paper look like I'm in, you know, an upper socioeconomic uh, bracket. Uh, if you put me in prison and I had to come out and I didn't have, you know, an ID, I was labeled um, a felon, I had all of the problems, what we call collateral consequences to deal with, I'd be slinging rocks too. I mean, it's like, damn straight. Um, and, you know, to say that as an alternative that, you know, you're just going to take time, um, I'd be interested in who the author um, of the text is and, and what else they um, they're providing in terms of support systems, because I don't think that yeah, I that's I don't think that that's a fair exchange um, at all. See, and our drug laws are the scandal of the civilized world, mm -hmm. uh, and it reflects again the contempt in policy, the contempt that's for a certain sector of our society. Because if they're not incarcerated, then you have to treat treat train and employ. But rather than create an industry devoted to that. We have created an industry that's devoted to controlling these people. Even when they're incarcerated, they're still under the control of social control agents. We can't allow these people to be at large, the state tells us. And it reflects a certain contempt. If you once again go to Amsterdam, go, go to uh, Northern Europe, and they have a very different orientation to drugs. And quite frankly, uh, they're, they're, the, the drug scene loses some of its mystification. There are some who go to drugs because they're illegal, and it's a, it's, it's a way of being a contrarian. And you take away the legal status, and it suddenly becomes boring. But, it suddenly Jerry, becomes demystified. But Jerry, you know, uh, if I could just, you see, but aren't we, if we talk constantly about what Northern Europe right. has, right. and they don't criminalize their populations mm -hmm. the way we criminalize ours, right. Well, one thing they don't have are large numbers of black people. Well, and that's therefore, right. yeah. See, but that's, that's the right. point. That's the point. That Western Europe that they have is, contempt for blacks too. Yeah, but they don't have blacks in their population. Okay. okay. So the the criminal justice system right. of the United States right. goes back to enslavement right. and Jim Crow. Now, whether you call it the new Jim Crow or the new slavery, mm -hmm. okay. it's probably both. Because the old Jim Crow was a form of enslavement also. I mean, the concept that we went from slavery to freedom, and freedom was partially was partial because it was Jim Crowed, I think gets it wrong. Mm -hmm. We never left slavery. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. We never left enslavement. And I, you know, um, well, you can say. Oh uh, yeah. Well, I one, mean, one, because see, we can talk. In these, and, and I'm not talking about y'all. No, I want to be See, included in the models that work. You yeah, know? but the, the but but no model can be applied here mm -hmm. unless 
We first do what Du Bois proposed. You mm -hmm. got to deal with this color line. Mm -hmm. Wow, well, which right. is which is which is an institute, as you say, an institution of the state, an institution of violence, an institution of coercion. Mm -hmm. And I also mentioned this mm -hmm. special brand of contempt and derision that is reserved for the African American. Well, man. that's it. I mean, that's what we're up against. That that is the problematic. That can't be seen as inevitable or in any way natural. And as long as that contempt uh, uh, prevails, it is not just African Americans that suffer, but the nation that suffers. So that we can't we can't adopt any of these humane ways of dealing with our social problems if the bottom line is to hurt the black man that's to the right. point where I'll even hurt myself that's as long as he gets hurt more. Mm -hmm. right. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let, let, me, let me call one of my former colleagues. Speak up, please. Good. I just want to add, I, I think you're both right. It was interesting, like, if you look at the policy debates, using uh, Europe as a model, like, with health care, one of the attacks they had for President Obama with health care, this was very open with Rush Limbaugh and on people on the right, was that it was reparations for black people. Yes. And they said that that, that would be unfair and it got racialized, just like yes. the welfare. So then it fits back to the thing about if ultimately the problem we're running into is about race, at some point we have to have that front and center, which is interesting because of course no one's talking about race and that's considered a political liability. That's right. Yeah, I, I just wanted to concur. That, I don't think in the four, six hundred years we've been here that this beast is going to change. Mm -hmm. So any other models, like Tony says, without us, it's not going to be applicable to us because this beast, this demon that we attempt to live humanely with, is not going to change. So if we don't understand where we are and what we're up against, shifting over time, it's not going to matter. Well, it can't go on like this. It's, it's not going to go on like well, this. Well, it can't. They will stuff the shrub. That, that, bingo. But they will stuff the shrub. Bingo. Now, the right. question becomes how close we will get to the destruction and if there will be enough left for us to do something with. But they have already had civilizations that have self-destructed. That's right. That's not a problem for them. And this wealthy group here has already examined that they do not care about a society. They do not care about a masses as long as they have until the clock stops. That's it. And when it's over, it's over. And they'll try and go somewhere else or redo it here. But they're not going to stop what they do. The question becomes, when are we willing mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. understand that it's got to be us? This is not an extern this is not going to come externally if we do not understand that it's about us, for us, and with us, then we're going to go down right beside the demon, the way the demon goes. And I suggest you not be too close. And don't keep them to your breath. If you don't understand Stevie Wonder, you quoted a couple of singers, to be in it and not of it. Yes, sir. After all of this time, right. they will go down in a handbasket and they don't give a damn. And that's where you are. Do you want to survive? Do we as a people feel as though our survival is more important than anything else? And that's the only thing that'll save. Unless it well, is. Jerry, let me let me call on Bill Sneed. Let me call on Bill Sneed and mm -hmm. and then Zarif. What well, I want to talk to you briefly about, I guess you call it determinism. And the reason I'm the reason why I'm saying determinism is because I was listening to public radio today and I heard a very disturbing story. I heard the story of Anne Frank and also of Simon Wiesenthal, who is associated with the Holocaust Museum. So I guess you wonder why would I bring that up? I, I bring it up because on the death of Simon Wiesenthal's parents and on the death of Anne Frank, the Mormons decided that they would baptize them posthumously and send them to a Mormon heaven. So I said to myself, I said, now wow, if these people believe that they can determine what heaven you go to, right, and you're not even of their religion, right. that goes to show you the level of control that they really have. So instead of just wanting to have the mother and the father in prison, right, they want to decide which heaven you go to and they want you to go to their heaven because ultimately the question is white nationalism versus black nationalism and which do you prefer? And in the case, if you prefer black nationalism and you prefer self-empowerment, then obviously 
The answer does not lie <clears throat> in Western Europe, yeah. nor in Western New York, or in Western anything. Now, I, the, the, the real truth <laughs> is that <clears throat> our freedom, our self-determination, all that depends on our seizing the reins of control of ourselves. And in the absence of that, we're not doing anything because we could get involved in a thousand dialogues about things, but these people are determined to control us. Ultimately, they could determine to control us. And until we seize that control of ourselves, which means that the control of our children, the control of our elders, control, you know, like the boy talked about the alcohol, etc., etc., doesn't matter. You can substitute, you can substitute whiskey for crack or whatever. But the real question is self-control and self-discipline. In the absence of those things, we have nothing, and that, that's my remark. Let me, just, let me just call on Zarif, and then I'm going to allow our two panelists to give concluding summations on their statements and what they take from the discussion. Zarif, could you stand up, sir? Yes. Um, what, what I'd like to, uh, to mention is, uh, is a perspective that I gained in talking to one of my colleagues earlier this week, and he presented to me a study that he had seen, a question. Uh, the question was given to at least 18 African-American women. And the question was, and before I go there, another young man came in here earlier, and he told me that he had a class, and he mentioned Tucson Overture to his class, and none of his students had any idea what he was talking about, though Tucson's legacy lives here in the Girard College of Youth. <laughs> but our level of awareness in all areas is, is very important, because we are people who collectively who don't know. You see? So when this question was asked to a group of, of, of African American women, the question was, do you think that white men, or that the forces of white men, or the power of white men, mm -hmm. or white America, is a threat to African Americans? All of these women, according to my colleague, answered no. Mm -hmm. Lastly, the same question was asked to a European male. And I'm sure you know what he said. Yes. Certainly. Yes. So, a lot of times, we, we are unaware of the threat. We are unaware of, of what we're, we're up against. So we, we really don't know. So I think, by and large, these discussions and these type of panels would be much, much more useful, as you said, to keep it in the hood, to keep it in the family, so that the people would become conscious of these things. You know, when we, I, I was, I was uh, doing a lecture at the uh, Montgomery, uh, Lower Montgomery High School a couple of years ago. And one of my partners, her son, was a young white male who had to do a report on Chenua Achebe's book, Things Fall Apart. Now, when most black Americans in this society know Things Fall Apart by the Roots album, <laughs> you see, not the book. But they got this in ninth grade in their Lower Montgomery High School, ninth grade, books that we don't read until we take black studies courses in college. That's true. So already before they are released, already before they have matured, they have already been given the ingredients and the information to monitor us and to control us, because they know how we work. But we don't get these informations. You see, we don't get these informations often until we go to college. Uh, we certainly don't get them if our father is not at home in our households. We certainly don't get them when our mother is depressed and she's not able to sit down intimately and talk to us. So information, it, it is really important that the information is made available to the people. And this is a fantastic idea that you, did, you, 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 you have here and your participants. But bring the information, continue to bring the information to the people because the people have to become aware. That's right. Who wants to go first? Can you want to go first and then Jerry? Yeah, a couple oh. more questions. Oh, oh I'm sorry. OK. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, quickly, Anthony. <laughs> you have an ally there. A quick question and a quick question. Stand up, please. Uh, as, as we speak about the right of these different solutions towards resolving these problems with respect to the African American community and things that have been going on, um, uh, Dr. Fulman was talking about, well, talking about Western Europe, looking at them, some of their ideals, right, in terms of economics, healthcare, so on and so forth. But also, what undergirds that? Because in some sense, we've got a Sankofa moment here. I mean, we've always developed solutions towards these things, right? So what is the fundamental distinction between America and Europe that's going on, right? Uh, and there's what, Europe tends to be more socialist. Right? Like, like, it tends to be more socialist. Still just as racist in a variety of different ways, but the ideal tends to be more socialist. Here in America, they still lock up white people and put them away for a long time, too, right? But over in Europe, they tend to do that a little bit less, 
right? So what's going on with that? Both of them still marginalized allowed to go back in the same, right? Yeah. To a huge extent, right? Got that, got that. But you're talking about this move towards socialism. People of African descent have been practicing socialism for thousands of years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So, all right. Let's let's go in real quick. All right. But at the same time, I'm stop. All right. Because I can just keep going and going. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. He can't so, go ahead. <laughs> 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 um, I have a question for this book real quick. As you start speaking about the prison industrial complex and also um, the uh, 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 idea of how Marx and Engels are going to abolish the prison industrial complex. Mm -hmm. My question is, what what would that look like? All right, all right. And two, does that mean that we abolish prisons? Right? This also was undergoing both of these things. That this, is this, as we take the Sanko for a moment again, right? Right? Is it what you talk about? How we have been socialized to this notion of a me, this I. Okay? It's always this I against them. That's why I do individualism. That's your being culture. Right? Well, that has that's the that's the fundamental distinction right there. So even when Du Bois talked about the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the colonial. The problem of the 21st century is really a problem of what does it mean to be human? Do I have obligations to other people? Do I got obligations to somebody just put a bullet in somebody's head? Right, right? So, this, so, there, so therefore, some prisons be about rehabilitation or punishment. And I'm going to stop the outside. Okay, thank you, Anthony. Uh, wow, now everybody wants to ask a question. Uh, okay, 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 then I'm going to. Uh, how, how many people want to ask? Okay. Uh, uh -huh. This gentleman, this, oh my God. Wait, could could you all hold some of these questions for the next panel? Okay, but, but go ahead. This is real easy. Okay, quickly. I'd like to make a suggestion that tonight all right. everyone go home for an hour and sit down and ask this question. You could take a hundred countries, you could take every country in the world, every state in the United States, every city in the United States or Europe, everywhere in the world, who draw a portrait of who runs the whole world. There is a group of people yes. that are in power yep. everywhere in the world. They are almost never women. They are almost always males. They are very normative in their behavior patterns. Who runs Russia? Who runs China? Who runs America? Who runs Britain? Who runs okay. Germany? Right. Who runs South Africa? Who runs Arabia? Who runs every place? And, and, we, will be, and we will be dealing with this question mm -hmm. tomorrow. We're going okay. in hard on that question, this gentleman. Um, to build upon the um, gentleman's back, um, I am a Latter day Saint, which is AKA Mormon. And to build upon that. Now we're really getting deep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, in no way, I was not practicing uh, Mormon at the time um, for my own reasons. But to build upon that, uh, you need to get the full story. There's a lot more behind that. And what we got to understand is that we're getting it from the media, from the news, what they're feeding us. You only got. Half the story. Okay. So we got to trace back. That's right. And we will further explore this question, and I'm certain the two of you can meet after this panel. <laughs> Stephen. Uh, we can't get in. Hey, Stephen, will you be back tomorrow? Thank you. We have put. Uh, okay, the last one. Yes. Uh, excuse my lack of French. Okay. But, uh, Wakam, yeah. He, in the distinction on your uh, graphic organizer, showed the hyper ghetto, which yes. is a fascinating idea, and the prison. Yes, sir. But when we talked about the displacement of family members and the destruction of communities via that, can we really divide that? And I just wanted to know where do we draw the line, how is it drawn, and what does it signify beyond just um, they're closely related, are they the same? Uh, how can we separate those communities right. that have been incarcerated and the soon to be or potentially incarcerated? Where does that line That's come right. down? I'm going to allow Kim to sum up and an answer, answer that question because I think that's the point of her methodology. It has to be a total methodology, comprehensive. So Kim Wilson and then 
uh, Gerald Foman. Okay, um, thank you for uh, all of your questions. Um, let's see if I can quickly um, address this. I'm not necessarily sure that there is a line. I think uh, these things lead into each other. Uh, it's very difficult to make a distinction between one and the other. Uh, oftentimes, these things are happening simultaneously. Uh, so it's not, you know, if you're in prison, you may also be living in the ghetto. You may also, you know, have a child who's also, you know, going through whatever. So uh, all of these things, I think, are um, interconnected and cannot necessarily be neatly separated um, for the purpose of analysis. Um, it, there are a lot of things that Laquant, I think, does really well, and uh, there are a number of articles um, where, where he addresses this issue much more deeply. I think that was um, this schematic is, um, is one way to look at it. Um, in terms of, uh, and I'm not sure I'm answering your, your question uh, fully, um, in terms of Anthony's um, question uh, about abolishing prisons and what would that look like, um, boy, it might look like heaven. I don't know if it's a, a Mormon heaven or some other kind of heaven, um, but you know, it, it would look pretty darn good as far as I'm concerned. Um, I think that we need a place uh, where you are going to put the worst of the worst, whatever that means. Um, but I think that, uh, by and large, many of the people are perhaps made worse, for lack of a better term, um, by being put in uh, an institutional setting for years at a time uh, for it, things that are just simply ridiculous. And, and I know I have personal experience uh, in my family with this, and I don't think that there's a single person in this room or anyone uh, who is part of the black community that doesn't know this firsthand. That's also something that we seldom ever talk about. Um, we talk about it in a very detached manner. We talk about it tangentially. We talk about it as if it's happening someplace else, but not to us. Um, so I think that's um, one thing. Uh, in terms of some of the other points that you made, I think that, you know, it, but what does it mean to be human? Um, boy, I think Du Bois um, has a lot to say about that. Um, I, I know that Dr. Montero's um, two articles, uh, from one from 2000, one from 2001, um, address this question um, very well, and I would refer you uh, to, to those articles. And I, I have the references here. Actually, I have the articles with me if you're um, if you're interested. I think um, you know a, as a, as a point of uh, Summation. Um, one of the things that sort of uh, struck me was that you know we talked about um, the, the prison industrial complex. We talked about mass incarceration and poverty and uh, violence. But um, one of the things that really sort of you know is um, working in the background is uh, capitalism, <laughs> um, and that's not something that was necessarily addressed in a more overt way. Um, and I think that's something that needs to be addressed. I think uh, Du Bois does a fantastic job um, of raising this point and saying that, you know, if we're going back to the issue of the color line, um, and if capitalism really operates as a sort of, you know, self-interested, self, you know, uh, system where, you know, it doesn't matter where my money is going, um, then we have a problem because, you know, it, it's if you can't hire someone who's out of prison because of their race, and it's usually because of their race, not so much because of their um, status as a felon, then that goes against the capitalist principle. You know, and it's like, okay, we haven't begun to really, I think, seriously interrogate that part um, of the system. But then again, we also have a lot of people who very proudly display their, you know, state property t-shirts. Um, mm. And that boy, they drank the Kool-Aid, and I find that just freaking fascinating on so many levels. But anyway, Jerry, I'm going to go uh, out on as, the as you as you sum sum up. You know, you've mentioned the Northern European model. Do you consider the Cuban model to no be question. viable? No okay. question. But, no question. So sum up. But I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here and suggest that at this late date, our fates are inextricably bound. You can't incarcerate your way out of this thing. You can't gateway community your way out of this thing. The essence of Kingism is that we are all related. Brother Cornell West wants you to know that we are all related. One of the, one of the things that you know, I find in European American males, they, they are taken aback by it when I refer to them as brother, because it is something that 
you know, it is beyond their, their, their uh, uh, ontological perspective to, to internalize. But it is essential that we realize that we are all related and get out of this thing that you will cut off your nose to spite your face just to see the black man go down, just to see him, to castrate the man. We're going to lynch him, but we're going to castrate him first. We have to get out of that because we're not going to make it separately. Reparations for everybody on the strength of the depth of the black man's suffering. So that that way, whites won't feel threatened. Let's not racialize the thing because the fact is, we're better off separating each other in terms of blood type than in terms of pigment. And the fact is that we all need certain things at an essential level. And when I look at you and you look at me, we have to see that we are related. One eye on each side of the nose. We're all related. And at this late date, the planet is inextricably bound. And we all have to develop a philosophy that says, who am I as a human? What does it mean to be human in that context? So that whether you're old, young, African-American, European-American, Asian, irrespective, um, all of these policies, Northern Europe, Cuba, they're all based on the fact that we are related. And it is not just that I succeed, that you have to succeed, or I am at risk for all my success. So I, I, would, I would leave you with that for, for consideration, that that person that doesn't look like you is related to you. Let's give the panel a round of applause. Let's give them a loud bark as well. <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank this panel, the initial inaugural panel in this two-day symposium. And if this one was great, <laughs> you can imagine what's coming up next. Uh, we will take a 10-minute break. We'll come back in here at 10 of 7. And our second panel consisting of Dr. Yaba Blay, Dr. Tabidi Asukale, and Dr. Nicole Montiero uh, will talk about the color line within the color line in a white hegemonic world.